Genevieve and Joe were working-class aristocrats. In an environment made up largely of sordidness and wretchedness, they had kept themselves unsullied and wholesome. Theirs was a self-respect, a regard for the niceties and clean things of life, which had held them aloof from their kind. Friends did not come to them easily, nor had either ever possessed a really intimate friend, a hard companion with whom to chum and have things in common. The social instinct was strong in them, yet they had remained lonely because they could not satisfy that instinct, and at the same time satisfy their desire for cleanness and decency. If ever a girl of the working class had led the sheltered life, it was Genevieve. In the midst of roughness and brutality, she had shunned all that was rough and brutal. She saw but what she chose to see, and she chose always to see the best, avoiding coarseness and uncouthness without effort as a matter of instinct. To begin with, she had been peculiarly unexposed. An only child, with an invalid mother upon whom she attended, she had not joined in the street games and frolics of the children of the neighborhood. Her father, a mild-tempered, narrow-chested, anemic little clerk, domestic because of his inherent disability to mix with men, had done his full share towards giving the home an atmosphere of sweetness and tenderness. An orphan at twelve, Genevieve had gone straight from her father's funeral to live with the Silversteins in their rooms above the candy store, and here, sheltered by the kindly aliens, she earned her keep and clothes by waiting on the shop. Being Gentile, she was especially necessary to the Silversteins, who would not run the business themselves when the day of their Sabbath came round. And here, in the uneventful little shop, six maturing years had slipped by. Her acquaintances were few. She had elected to have no girl chum for the reason that no satisfactory girl had appeared nor did she choose to walk with the young fellows of the neighborhood, as was the custom of girls from their fifteenth year. That stuck-up doll face was the way the girls of the neighborhood described her, and though she earned their enmity by her beauty and aloofness, she none the less commanded their respect. Peaches and cream, she was called by the young men, though softly and amongst themselves, for they were afraid of arousing the ire of the other girls, while they stood in awe of Genevieve, in a dimly religious way, as a something mysteriously beautiful and unapproachable. For she was indeed beautiful. Springing from a long line of American descent, she was one of those wonderful working-class blooms which occasionally appear, defying all precedent of forebearers and environment, apparently without cause or explanation. She was a beauty in color, the blood spraying her white skin so deliciously as to earn for her the apt description, peaches and cream. She was a beauty in the regularity of her features, and, if for no other reason, she was a beauty in the mere delicacy of the lines on which she was molded. Quiet, low-voiced, stately, and dignified, she somehow had the knack of dress, and but befitted her beauty and dignity with anything she put on. Withal, she was surely feminine, tender and soft and clinging, with the smoldering passion of the mate and the motherliness of the woman. But this side of her nature had lain dormant through the years, waiting for the mate to appear. Then Joe came into Silverstein's shop one hot Saturday afternoon to cool himself with ice cream soda. She had not noticed his entrance, being busy with one other customer, an urchin of six or seven, who gravely analyzed his desires before the showcase wherein truly generous and marvelous candy creations reposed under a cardboard announcement, five for five cents. She had heard ice cream soda, please, and had herself asked, What flavor? without seeing his face. 
For that matter, it was not a custom of hers to notice young men. There was something about them she did not understand. The way they looked at her made her uncomfortable, she knew not why, while there was an uncouthness and roughness about them that did not please her. As yet, her imagination had been untouched by man. The young fellows she had seen held no lure for her, had been without meaning to her. In short, had she been asked to give one reason for the existence of men on earth, she would have been nonplussed for a reply. As she emptied the measure of ice cream into the glass, her casual glance rested on Joe's face, and she experienced on the instant a pleasant feeling of satisfaction. The next instant his eyes were upon her face, her eyes had dropped, and she was turning away toward the soda fountain. But at the fountain, filling the glass, she was impelled to look at him again, but for no more than an instant, for this time she found his eyes already upon her, waiting to meet hers, while on his face was a frankness of interest that caused her quickly to look away. That such pleasingness would reside for her in any man astonished her. What a pretty boy, she thought to herself, innocently and instinctively trying to ward off the power to hold and draw her that lay behind the mere prettiness. Besides, he isn't pretty, she thought, as she placed the glass before him, received the silver diamond payment, and for the third time looked into his eyes. Her vocabulary was limited, and she knew little of the worth of words, but the strong masculinity of his boy's face told her that the term was inappropriate. He must be handsome, then, was her next thought, as she again dropped her eyes before his. But all good-looking men were called handsome, and that term, too, displeased her. But whatever it was, he was good to see, and she was irritably aware of a desire to look at him again and again. As for Joe, he had never seen anything like this girl across the counter. While he was wiser in natural philosophy than she, and could have given immediately the reason for woman's existence on the earth, nevertheless woman had no part in his cosmos. His imagination was as untouched by woman as the girl's was by man. But his imagination was touched now, and the woman was Genevieve. He had never dreamed a girl could be so beautiful, and he could not keep his eyes from her face. Yet every time he looked at her, and her eyes met his, he felt painful embarrassment and would have looked away had not her eyes dropped so quickly. But when, at last, she slowly lifted her eyes and held their gaze steadily, it was his own eyes that dropped, his own cheek that mantled red. She was much less embarrassed than he, while she betrayed her embarrassment not at all. She was aware of a flutter within, such as she had never known before, but in no way did it disturb her outward serenity. Joe, on the contrary, was obviously awkward and delightfully miserable. Neither knew love, and all that either was aware was an overwhelming desire to look at the other. Both had been troubled and roused, and they were drawing together with the sharpness and imperativeness of uniting elements. He toyed with his spoon and flushed his embarrassment over his soda, but lingered on, and she spoke softly, dropped her eyes, and wove her witchery about him. But he could not linger forever over a glass of ice-cream soda, while he did not dare ask for a second glass. So he left her to remain in the shop in a waking trance, and went away himself down the street like a somnambulist. Genevieve dreamed through the afternoon and knew that she was in love. Not so with Joe. He knew only that he wanted to look at her again, to see her face. His thoughts did not get beyond this, and besides, it was scarcely a thought, being more a dim and inarticulate desire. The urge of this desire he could not escape, 
Day after day it worried him, and the candy store and the girl behind the counter continually obtruded themselves. He fought off the desire. He was afraid and ashamed to go back to the candy store. He solaced his fear with, I ain't a ladies' man. Not once nor twice, but scores of times, he muttered the thought to himself, but it did no good. And by the middle of the week, in the evening, after work, he came into the shop. He tried to come in carelessly and casually, but his whole carriage advertised the strong effort of will that compelled his legs to carry his reluctant body thither. Also, he was shy and awkwarder than ever. Genevieve, on the contrary, was serener than ever, though fluttering most alarmingly within. He was incapable of speech, mumbled his order, looked anxiously at the clock, dispatched his ice-cream soda in tremendous haste, and was gone. She was ready to weep with vexation. Such meager reward for four days' waiting, and assuming all the time that she loved. He was a nice boy and all that, she knew, but he needn't have been in so disgraceful a hurry. But Joe had not reached the corner before he wanted to be back with her again. He just wanted to look at her. He had no thought that it was love. Love? That was when young fellows and girls walked out together. As for him, and then his desire took sharper shape, and he discovered that was the very thing he wanted her to do. He wanted to see her, to look at her, and well could he do all this if she but walked out with him. Then that was why young fellows and girls walked out together, he mused, as the weekend drew near. He had remotely considered this walking out to be a mere form or observance preliminary to matrimony. Now he saw the deeper wisdom in it, wanted it himself, and concluded therefrom that he was in love. Both were now of the same mind, and there could be but the one ending, and it was the mild nine days wonder of Genevieve's neighborhood when she and Joe walked out together. Both were blessed with an avarice of speech, and because of it their courtship was a long one. As he expressed himself in action, she expressed herself in repose and control, and by the love-light in her eyes though this latter she would have suppressed in all maiden modesty had she been conscious of the speech her heart printed so plainly there. Dear and darling were too terribly intimate for them to achieve quickly, and unlike most mating couples, they did not overwork the love words. For a long time they were content to walk together in the evenings, or to sit side by side on a bench in the park, neither uttering a word for an hour at a time, merely gazing into each other's eyes, too faintly luminous in the starshine to be a cause for self-consciousness and embarrassment. He was as chivalrous and delicate in his attention as any knight to his lady. When they walked along the street, he was careful to be on the outside, somewhere he had heard that this was the proper thing to do, and when a crossing to the opposite side of the street put him on the inside, he swiftly sidestepped behind her to gain the outside again. He carried her parcels for her, and once, when rain threatened, her umbrella. He had never heard of the custom of sending flowers to one's lady-love, so he sent Genevieve fruit instead. There was utility in fruit. It was good to eat. Flowers never entered his mind, until, one day, he noticed a pale rose in her hair. It drew his gaze again and again. It was her hair, therefore the presence of the flower interested him. Again it interested him, because she had chosen to put it there. For those reasons he was led to observe the rose more closely. He discovered that the effect in itself was beautiful, and it fascinated him. His ingenuous delight in it was a delight to her, and a new and mutual love thrill was theirs, because of a flower. Straight away he became a lover of flowers. Also he became an inventor in gallantry. He sent her a bunch of violets. 
The idea was his own. He had never heard of a man sending flowers to a woman. Flowers were used for decorative purposes, also for funerals. He sent Genevieve flowers nearly every day, and so far as he was concerned the idea was original, as positive an invention as ever arose in the mind of man. He was tremulous in his devotion to her, as tremulous as she was in her reception of him. She was all that was pure and good, a holy of holies, not lightly to be profaned even by what might possibly be the too ardent reverence of a devotee. She was a being wholly different from any he had ever known. She was not as other girls. It never entered his head that she was of the same clay as his own sisters or anybody's sisters. She was more than mere girl, than mere woman. She was, well, she was Genevieve, a being of a class by herself, nothing less than a miracle of creation. And for her, in turn, there was in him but little less of illusion. Her judgment of him in minor things might be critical, while his judgment of her was sheer worship and had in it nothing critical at all. But in her judgment of him as a whole she forgot the sum of the parts and knew him only as a creature of wonder who gave meaning to life and for whom she could die as willingly as she could live. She often beguiled her waking dreams of him with fancied situations wherein, dying for him, she at last adequately expressed the love she felt for him and which, living, she knew she could never fully express. Their love was all fire and dew. The physical scarcely entered into it, for such seemed profanation. The ultimate physical facts of their relation were something which they never considered, yet the immediate physical facts they knew, the immediate yearnings and raptures of the flesh, the touch of fingertips on hand or arm, the momentary pressure of a hand-clasp, the rare lip-caress of a kiss, the tingling thrill of her hair upon his cheek, of her hand lightly thrusting back the locks from above his eyes. All this they knew, but also, and they knew not why, there seemed a hint of sin about these caresses and sweet bodily contacts. There were times when she felt impelled to throw her arms around him in a very abandonment of love, but always some sanctity restrained her. At such moments she was distinctly and unpleasantly aware of some unguessed sin that lurked within her. It was wrong, undoubtedly wrong, that she should wish to caress her lover in so unbecoming a fashion. No self-respecting girl could dream of doing such a thing. It was unwomanly. Besides, if she had done it, what would he have thought of it? And while she contemplated so horrible a catastrophe, she seemed to shrivel and wilt in a furnace of secret shame. Nor did Joe escape the prick of curious desires, chiefest among which, perhaps, was the desire to hurt Genevieve. When... After long and torturous degrees he had achieved the bliss of putting his arm round her waist, he felt spasmodic impulses to make the embrace crushing till she should cry out with the hurt. It was not his nature to wish to hurt any living thing. Even in the ring, to hurt was never the intention of any blow he struck. In such case he played the game, and the goal of the game was to down an antagonist and keep that antagonist down for a space of ten seconds. So he never struck merely to hurt. The hurt was incidental to the end, and the end was quite another matter. And yet here, with this girl he loved, came the desire to hurt. Why, when with thumb and forefinger he had ringed her wrist, he should desire to contract that ring till it crushed, was beyond him. He could not understand, and felt that he was discovering depths of brutality in his nature of which he had never dreamed. Once, on parting, he threw his arms around her and swiftly drew her against him. 
Her gasping cry of surprise and pain brought him to his senses and left him there very much embarrassed and still trembling with a vague and nameless delight. And she, too, was trembling. And the hurt itself, which was the essence of the vigorous embrace, she had found delight, and again she knew sin, though she knew not its nature nor why it should be sin. Came the day, very early in their walking out, when Silverstein chanced upon Joe in his store, and stared at him with saucer eyes. Came likewise the scene, after Joe had departed, when the maternal feelings of Mrs. Silverstein found vent in a diatribe against all prize-fighters, and against Joe Fleming in particular. Vainly had Silverstein striven to stay the spouse's wrath. There was need for her wrath. All the maternal feelings were hers, but none of the maternal rights. Genevieve was aware only of the diatribe. She knew a flood of abuse was pouring from the lips of the Jewess, but she was too stunned to hear the details of the abuse. Joe, her Joe, was Joe Fleming the prize-fighter. It was abhorrent, impossible, too grotesque to be believable. Her clear-eyed, girl-cheeked Joe might be anything but a prize-fighter. She had never seen one, but he in no way resembled her conception of what a prize-fighter must be, the human brute with tiger eyes and a streak for a forehead. Of course she had heard of Joe Fleming, who in West Oakland had not, but that there should be anything more than a coincidence of names had never crossed her mind. She came out of her days to hear Mrs. Silverstein's hysterical sneer, "'Keepin' company vid a bruiser!' Next Silverstein and his wife fell to differing on noted and notorious as applicable to her lover. "'But he is a good boy,' Silverstein was contending. "'He make der money, and he safe der money.' "'You tell me dat,' Mrs. Silverstein screamed. "'Vat you know? You know too much!' You spend good money on der prize fighters. How you know? Tell me dat. How you know? I know vat I know, Silverstein held on sturdily, a thing Genevieve had never before seen him do when his wife was in her tantrums. His father die, he go to work in Hansen's sail loft. He have six brothers and sisters younger as he is. He is der little father. He work hard all der time. He buy her bread and her meat and pay her rent. On Saturday night he bring home ten dollars. Then Hansen give him twelve dollars. What he do? He is der little father. He bring it home to der mother. He work all der time. He get twenty dollars. What he do? He bring it home. Der little brothers and sisters go to school. Very good clothes. Half better bread and meat. Der mother lift fat, there is joy in der eye, and she is proud of her good boy Joe. But he half der beautiful body, ach, God, der beautiful body, stronger as der ox, quicker as der tiger cat, der head cooler as der ice box, der eyes vat see everything, quick just like dat. He put on der gloves vit the boys at Hansen's loft. He put on der gloves vit the boys at der warehouse. He go before der club. He knock out der spider. Kvick, one punch, just like dat, der first time. Der purse is five dollars. Vat he do? He bring it home to der mother. He go many times before der clubs. He get many purses. Ten dollars, fifty dollars, one hundred dollars. But he do. Tell me dat. Quit der job at Hansen's? After good time vit der boys? No, no, he is der good boy. He vork every day. He fight at night before der clubs. He say, Vat for I pay der rent, Silverstein? To me. Silverstein, he say dat. Never mind vat I say, but he buy der good house for der mother. All der time he vork at Hansen and fight before der clubs to pay for der house. He buy der piano for der sisters, der carpets, der pictures on der vall. And he is all der time straight. He bet on himself. That is der good sign. 
Ven der man bets on himself, dat is der time you bet too. Here Mrs. Silverstein groaned her horror of gambling, and her husband, aware that his eloquence had betrayed him, collapsed into voluble assurances that he was ahead of the game. And all because of Joe Fleming, he concluded. I back him every time to win. But Genevieve and Joe were preeminently mated, and nothing, not even this terrible discovery, could keep them apart. In vain Genevieve tried to steel herself against him, but she fought herself, not him. To her surprise she discovered a thousand excuses for him, found him lovable as ever, and she entered into his life to be his destiny, and to control him after the way of women. She saw his future and hers through glowing vistas of reform, and her first great deed was when she had wrung from him his promise to cease fighting. And he, after the way of men, pursuing the dream of love and striving for possession of the precious and deathless object of desire, had yielded. And yet, in the very moment of promising her, he knew vaguely, deep down, that he could never abandon the game, that somewhere, sometime, in the future, he must go back to it. And he had had a swift vision of his mother and brothers and sisters, their multitudinous wants, the house with its painting and repairing, its street assessments and taxes, and of the coming of children to him and Genevieve, and of his own daily wage in the sail-making loft. But the next moment the vision was dismissed, as such warnings are always dismissed, and he saw before him only Genevieve, and he knew only his hunger for her, and the call of his being to her, and he accepted calmly her calm assumption of his life and actions. He was twenty, she was eighteen, boy and girl, the pair of them, and made for progeny, healthy and normal, with steady blood pounding through their bodies, and wherever they went together, even on Sunday outings across the bay, amongst people who did not know him, eyes were continually drawn to them. He matched her girl's beauty with his boy's beauty, her grace with his strength, her delicacy of line and fiber with the harsher vigor and muscle of the male. Frank-faced, fresh-colored, almost ingenuous in expression, eyes blue and white apart, he drew and held the gaze of more than one woman far above him in the social scale. Of such glances and dim maternal promptings he was quite unconscious, though Genevieve was quick to see and understand, and she knew each time the pang of a fierce joy in that he was hers, and that she held him in the hollow of her hand. He did see, however, and rather resented, the men's glances drawn by her. These two she saw and understood, as he did not dream of understanding. End of chapter